Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle, the show, as you know, that brings you the libertarian perspective on burning issues of the day. Today, I'm, uh, it's a great pleasure to have a good friend of mine named Pete Betke. Uh, Pete is a professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University. He's got lots of other titles like the bb and T Professor for the Study of Capitalism and the Director of the F.A. Hayek Program and, and others uh, associated with the Mercatus Institute. He's got several books. Um, the most recent one is called Living Economics and several books on the demise of the Soviet Union. I guess in a nutshell, Pete is one of the most brilliant exponents of Austrian economics in the world. So, Pete, welcome to the show. Well, thanks a lot, Bumper. I'm not sure I would describe myself that way, but I appreciate the, the thought. Well, one of the things that's always uh, struck me about you, Pete, is that you're an academic that has that unique ability to address not only an academic audience, but also a popular lay audience, especially on things that are very complicated, that, which can be complicated, like Austrian economics. And I've seen you give talks, and, of course, you've talked uh, for – the Future of Freedom Foundation in our programs, and it yeah. amazes me is how you can flow in and out and attract both the uh, and appeal to both the uh, the academic audience and the popular audience. So I thought maybe you do a little bit of it today, and we talk about Austrian economics and talk about where Austrian economics is now, where we're going, uh, and so forth. Ah, that's great. I attribute any any uh, ability of uh, me to do that uh, to uh, my exposure uh, when I was a kid to uh, Hans Senholtz, uh, who uh, was my teacher of economics uh, and taught me how to, um, you know, do all this stuff. And, uh, um, and then the teachers I had here uh, at George Mason when I was a graduate student, uh, which includes, uh, you know, from Walter Williams to uh, Jim Buchanan, um, all of whom are um, talk in plain language, but talk in very subtle terms about the world around them. And uh, I think we've gotten better economic communicators uh, in the last 20 years. So people like Russ, Ro Russ Roberts and Don Boudreau and, you know, they've really um, – become amazingly good economic communicators that talk not only to their scientific peers, but to the general public. And, um, and as you know, our good mutual friend, Richard Ebeling, always had that ability to go between these audiences. So I think it's one of the great advantages of Austrian economics is that it teaches a, um, uh, its practitioners a strong – a uh, set of uh, core principles um, that can build up from the basics all the way to very complicated analysis of the economy in a step-by-step -step kind of way, and uh, you can carry a lot of people a long way <laughs> along those steps as you build up the explanation. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Hans Sinnels because uh, Hans – played a, a major role for me in my intellectual development when I discovered libertarianism and went to seminars at the Foundation for Economic Education right. because he was always lecturing there, and uh, he taught at, at Grove City College. I guess that's where you got your undergraduate degree at Grove City? Right, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And well, we met at Fee. That's where we first oh, met really? was when you were working at Fee. Oh, yes. wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I yeah. remember Hans saying that he was the only – Austrian economic, economist that spoke with a genuine Austrian accent or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He would say stuff like that. And, uh, but he was, a, um, you know, someone who really cared passionately uh, about teaching the basic principles of economics. And uh, so when he retired after 30 years of teaching at Grove City College, it's a small college in western Pennsylvania, 2,200 students, and he retired. Over 300 of us went to his retirement dinner at our own expense. And uh, those were people that were professors, but also people that were leading up think tanks uh, to, you know, very politically um, active groups like uh, Freedom Works. Matt Kibbe, who runs Freedom Works, he was a Grove City 
uh, student, Alex Chaplin, who runs the Atlas uh, Economic Research Institute. He's a Grove City person. People like myself and Sandy Akita are professors. And so Senholtz had this amazing impact on uh, young people in a small uh, liberal arts college um, who ended up by devoting their lives to general economic education. And uh, just, just fantastic. Great role model. Yeah, and he got his doctorate under Ludwig von Mises, didn't he? Uh, yes, yep. Yeah, he was part that. of that generation of Mises' students at NYU. Yeah, and, so, and you sort of come out of that tradition. That, now, I know you taught at NYU. Did you go there also? or? Uh, no, I taught at NYU for uh, roughly a decade, a little bit less than a decade. Um, but I went to George Mason, and then I taught at NYU uh, for the first part of my career, and then George Mason hired me back here. I see. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Ludwig von Mises and NYU and the seminar that you mentioned. I mean, obviously, Mises is the big figure in Austrian economics, and right. uh, there's yeah. several other figures, but to me, he stands out. There's, of course, Hayek and so forth, but for me, Mises really stands out. Can you just apprise people of who Mises was and where he figures in in Austrian sure. economics? So, um, Ludwig von Mises, in my opinion, is the greatest economist that ever lived. So, uh, I agree with you <laughs> about that. I, I consider Mises the greatest economist and Kersner and, and Hayek to be his greatest students. Um, but uh, Ludwig von Mises, I think you can divide his career, his teaching career, um, into three different uh, uh, periods. His, his period in Vienna. Uh, when he was a younger economist, uh, and uh, he had amazing uh, students there. Um, besides Hayek, you also would have to include Fritz Machla, Oscar Morgenstern, and Gottfried Hobbler, among others. Um, and so that is from roughly uh, 1920s uh, through the, the middle part of the 1930s. Um, and then he moves to Geneva, where he was in Geneva. He's a professor uh, in Switzerland, and he was there from 1934, I think, to 1940. And then he moves in 1940 to the United States, and he starts teaching at New York University in 1945, and he taught there until 1969, so from 1945 to 1969. And uh, during that period, he had additional uh, graduate students, um, which would be Hans Senholtz and, and uh, Israel Kirshner would be the leaders of that group. Um, but in addition, he developed a close relationship with Murray Rothbard, who was also a New Yorker and uh, was a student at Columbia, but became very much influenced <clears throat> by Mises after he published Human Action. and. Uh, and so Rothbard also um, sort of uh, developed Austrian economics. And then the modern Austrian school in academia is really a, um, a consequence of Hayek winning the Nobel Prize in 74, um, but then also um, the efforts of Kirzner and Rothbard in a league with the Institute for Humane Studies to introduce a, a whole new generation of people uh, to the Austrian School of Economics. And that effort took place in the 1970s and 1980s. And then, uh, and then you saw this explosion of these research centers and education centers um, that came out of that effort. And uh, that gets us to the um, kind of academic uh, wing of Austrian economics today as well as the popular spreading of the ideas through Foundation for Economic Education, the Future of Freedom Foundation, uh, uh, the Mises Institute itself, um, libertarian, various think tanks and whatnot. Um, but Mises um, was this uh, towering intellectual figure. Um, he was, um, it's very important to stress to the the audience that uh, despite the fact that he was unpopular as an economic thinker among the then current generation of 
Keynesian macroeconomists and market socialists, he was a very well recognized and known figure in economics. He, won, he was the distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association in 1969. That's kind of like getting in the Hall of Fame of economists. So it, it, he didn't he didn't he didn't play for the New York Yankees, so he doesn't get you know recognized like Babe Ruth does. But he kind of was recognized the way that like uh, someone who might have played for the Pittsburgh Pirates, you know, gets recognized and as a, as a leading person. But he made the Hall of Fame, you know. So when people say things like he, no one knew who he was, that's not really true. They all knew who he was. They just didn't like what he had to say. But they recognized that he was this towering intellectual figure. And so he was named the Distinguished Fellow of the American Economic Association. He also won the highest Medal of Scientific Achievement from his home country of Austria as well. Um, but he, his, he, he was decidedly writing at a time when everyone believed that you should turn more and more of economic management over to the state. And Mises was a defender of the laissez-faire position. So the state was causing the problems, not the solution to our problems. And he, he gave very strong, rigorous arguments for that. He was an anti-inflationist. Um, he was a sound money advocate at a time when people thought that we needed to have looser monetary policy or uh, very uh, activist uh, fiscal policy in order to fix our problems. And uh, Mises instead was for uh, kind of sound money and responsible fiscal policy um, and an and, and anti-interventionist economist. Um, but, you know, he was – his towering intellect wasn't just at that policy level. It also was at a very remote scientific level about the methodology and methods of economic analysis. And he made original contributions in all of these areas. But what we know about him today um, and think about most of us, uh, not the rare few that work in scientific economics, but the, the cultural aspects of Mises is his, his uh, strong opposition to statism and his uh, economic arguments why statism will not be able to achieve the goals it sets for itself. And so in that, I think Mises is a shining example of rigorous economic knowledge applied to public policy issues. Yeah, I want the, one of the fascinating parts of his life for me is when he came over here, uh, he was like this, this lonely figure, even though, as I understand, in Austria, he, Austria, he was a, a famous guy. I mean, he held high positions, yeah. very renowned, uh, right? He, he had some yeah, big yeah. positions. He would be, he'd, he'd, I mean, he'd be roughly the equivalent of someone in Austria. He'd be roughly the equivalent of someone who was like the council, the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, you know, to the – right? And so, um, though it was a slightly different position than that, but that would be the rough equivalent. And, um, and uh, you know, when he came to the United States, he worked for – he was 60 years old. You have to remember that, right? He was 60 when he came to the United States. So he didn't, uh, you know, uh, he didn't move to the United States like the way Hayek moved to London. When Hayek moved from Vienna to London, he was only 31 years old. He had his whole world in front of him to adjust and adapt to this new culture. Mises doesn't start writing in English until he's in the United States. And so, you know, he does, he, he, you know, 60 years old and he's trying to not only fit into a new culture, but also learn to write scientific contributions in that new culture and also broader policies. And so he moves to the United States in 1940. Um, his students are famous economists now. Mocklop is teaching at Johns Hopkins and Hayek is, is eventually going to teach at Chicago and Hobbler is up at Harvard, and Schumpeter, who was a classmate of Mises, is at Harvard, and Morgan Stern is at Princeton. Um, and so, you know, Mises' students have done very well fitting into the United States, but they had moved here a decade earlier. And uh, Mrs. Mises, from what I understand, Mrs. Mises really loved living in Manhattan uh, because they lived in a section of Manhattan which was called at the time Little Vienna which was all the, 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 the Vienna, Viennese immigrants. And so Mises kind of was 
was stuck to New York City in a way, and so he couldn't pursue options or chose not to pursue options that were afforded to him at places like UCLA or um, University of Rochester and instead, you know, chose to stay in New York um, where he built his, his U.S. life. And, you know, he, he lived till 93 years of age, so it's amazing. And he was teaching all the way up until he was like 89, I think, or, or 90 years old. Um, so uh, just a phenomenal career of longevity and productivity. Um, but by the time he came to the United States, his ideas were very much decidedly out of favor. Um, his close friend uh, was Henry Hazlitt. And Henry Hazlitt really helped Mises in the 1940s and 50s develop his own style of writing and whatnot here in English. Uh, and, you know, those books are phenomenal that Mises wrote during his English, his U.S. period. Uh, there are a book named Bureaucracy, uh, another book called Omnipotent Government, which is sort of like Mises' version of The Road to Serfdom. Uh, it's called Omnipotent Government. Then, of course, his, his magnum opus, Human Action. Uh, but then he wrote a really great book called Theory and History, uh, which doesn't get played up enough. Uh, and, you know, his books were all published by Yale University Press, you know, those, those four books that I just mentioned to you. Um, and so he was a, he was a you know, a, a, an establishment person, whose views were very, very viewed as something in the past. <laughs> you know, like like Hazlitt says that when Mises called him, he thought that it might as well have been someone calling and saying, uh, John Stuart Mill here, you know, because <laughs> he thought Mises had passed away already, you know. Uh, um, but So Mises' ideas were very much more like classical liberal ideas from the 19th century as opposed to the statist ideas of the 20th century. Yeah, I love that story that Hazlitt tells. Of course, Hazlitt was a fairly famous economist, free market economist, libertarian, had right. a regular column in Newsweek, I think it was. And yeah. um, I love that story that Hazlitt tells where he, the phone rings and he picks it up and somebody says, this is Mises. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God, it's like yeah. God that he just arrived well, my, in New my, York. My favorite, my favorite Mises story is actually a Ralph Rako. Uh, story and uh, Ralph Rico was a, uh, a high school kid at, at Bronx Science, which is a magnet school or a charter school for very gifted science kids. And Ralph later on uh, went to graduate school at the um, University of Chicago, where he earned his PhD under uh, under Hayek's direction. Um, but when Ralph was a high school kid, he got interested in Mises, and he found out that where Mises lived. In, uh, in Manhattan, and he and George Reisman, another of his classmates at Bronx Science, who later on became an economist and actually wrote his Ph.D. with Mises, when they were high school kids, they went to Mises' apartment and knocked on the door. And uh, they, they, under the, um, you know, false uh, pretense that they were selling subscriptions to the Freeman, okay? And so supposedly Mises opened the door and they said, we're selling subscriptions to the Freeman under the idea that Mises would say, oh, you guys are involved with fee. Come on in. Let's talk about free market <laughs> ideas or whatever. And supposedly Mises answered the door, and they said, we're selling subscriptions to the Freeman. He looked at him. He says, I already get the Freeman, and then closed the door. <laughs> <laughs> so their, their grand scheme didn't work out uh, to get to talk to the great man. But, uh, but yeah, well, so. I got one to um, match. I got one that doesn't quite match that, but pretty good. That uh, You mentioned Richard Eveling earlier. And, of course, Richard has a long background in Austrian economics, and Richard and I go back to when we both lived in Dallas together, and Richard actually right. gave me a personal tutorial chapter by chapter in human action, Mises' magnum opus. Yeah. Well, one Could day we're a in, better teacher. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Well, one day we're in New York City, and uh, Richard says, how would you like to meet Margaret Mises? And, of course, I said, fantastic. And he says, well, I'm going to her apartment to visit with her in Manhattan, and so you can come along with me. So we go into there, and I meet Margaret Mises, and she serves us tea on this really nice china and stuff and, when, and little cookies and stuff. And when we're finished, she says to me, I would like to continue my 
conversation with Richard. Now, she's like 90 or something at this point. She says, would you mind washing the dishes for me? And I said, of course not. So I go in the kitchen, and I'm washing the dishes, terribly nervous. I'm going to break the china or something. And at the end of it, she gives me a copy of, of Mises' book, Omnipotent Government, hardback copy. And she inscribes in it, for a job well done, to, you know, to, to Jacob Hornberger, for a job well done, Margaret Mises. And she looks at me with a smile on her face and says, no one will ever know what the job was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he yeah. arrives so, in New York. And, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, so Mises is teaching at NYU, and uh, Senholtz goes to study with him uh, and gets his Ph.D., and then moves to first Iona College in New Rochelle, New York, and then J. Howard Pugh lures Senholtz to go to Grove City, and that's uh, where they sort of set up shop for an Austrian program, really the only program in the United States that was teaching Mises' ideas. And then Israel Kirzner comes after Senholtz, and uh, in Kirzner, uh, you know, Mises recognized that this is a world-class scholar that he's working with. So uh, as Kirzner always says, Mises called him aside and told him he should go to Hopkins and get his Ph.D. with Fritz Machla, because Fritz Machla was younger. He was a former Mises student. He could help. Kirzner in his career, but Kirzner chose to stay at NYU and get his Ph.D. under Mises' direction, and then he got hired by New York University, and, uh, and then he taught, Kirzner taught at New York University for the next 40 years, and he developed an Austrian economics program um, after Mises' death uh, that became the kind of centerpiece for graduate training in Austrian economics. So Senholtz kind of dominate the market for undergraduate training. And then Kersner was the centerpiece of where you went. And a lot of people uh, went to Grove City and then to NYU, you know, that, that you know, panel. And then also Hillsdale College uh, later on had Austrian economists there. And so people would go to Hillsdale College. And Hillsdale and Grove City, uh, Grove City has Mises' private papers and Hillsdale has his library. So uh -huh. you were just mentioning our good friend uh, Richard Ebeling. He became, in the 1980s, he became the Ludwig von Mises professor at Hillsdale College. And he taught a group of fantastic students uh, that include my colleague Pete Leeson, but also Ryan Opria and Robert Murphy, who some of your um uh, you know, listeners might have heard of Robert Murphy. Um, they were all Ebeling students, and they've gone on to do fantastic things. Um, and then, of course, I said already the Senholtz students. Um, and since that time, the numbers have grown so that you can't name, like, any one school that's great, but there's a lot of schools. University of Dallas, where Richard taught at one time, had Sam Bostoff and Richard teaching there, and so students learned about Austrian economics there and so, I mean, it was a small but very vocal and dedicated group that grew out of that NYU era under, under Mises. So yeah, when, he did a lot with a little, which is amazing. Yeah, it really is. And, and Kersner's, uh, Kersner had a big uh, impact on me. And, of course, you, when you were teaching there at NYU those 10 years, Kersner was, was there. And when I went to yeah. fee to be program director – uh, Kurs, I asked Kersner if I could audit a couple of his classes, and he said yes, and it was just a fantastic experience. I audited uh, Fundamentals of Austrian Economics and History of Economic Thought, and yeah. um, nobody can explain the stuff better than Kersner. Uh, in fact, wow, he's, he, uh, yeah. yeah, you had that <laughs> he's great. He's a very dedicated teacher. He used to put a sign outside of his door. I mean, he's been lecture, he's been teaching at NYU for 40 years, so. I mean, your, your listeners will appreciate this. I had two kids in Catholic school at the time. NYU is the, uh, one of the most expensive private colleges uh, in the United States. And I'm, I'm sitting in my office, and I'm writing out the check for my kids' you know, Catholic tuition. And I stopped for a second, and I thought, who would I be willing to pay the money for <laughs> to have my kid educated at NYU? 
you know, like pay that bill to go to NYU to do it. And I looked down the hall and I would go, you know, Professor A, no, <laughs> Professor B, you know, no. And the only one that I settled in on was Israel Kirsner. And I'd say, yep, he's the worth, he's <laughs> more than worth the price of admission there. But he used to have a, a little sign he put outside of his, his door that said the following. He said, if Professor Kirsner's door is closed, it means he cannot be disturbed because he's preparing for class. And he would spend an hour before every class that he had been teaching. And keep in mind, he's been doing this for 40 years. So he would get his thoughts collected and be very clear on his notes and everything before he went and taught. So he's one of the best lecturers you could ever see on complicated material because he's so prepared and so professional. He was a fantastic role model as a senior colleague to try to learn from. And uh, I'm forever grateful for the years that I got to spend working with him. It's just phenomenal. Yeah, anybody, anytime you can find a, a lecture online by Kersner, take a look at it. The guy's absolutely fantastic. You know, Pete, when I was in college, I was an economics major, and I never heard anything about Austrian economics. And it's just standard yeah. Keynesian stuff, model building and so forth. And, and since then, Mises has had the biggest impact on me. Now, it's certainly Hayek, especially with things like the yeah. pretense of knowledge and the use of knowledge in society. But, but, but what I loved was was Mises's uncompromising attitude, which I didn't find as much yeah. in Hayek, especially in his book Constitution of Liberty, where he justifies a minimal welfare state. But can you tell people? What are the real fundamental differences between mainstream economics, regular economics that you get in high school and college courses, and Austrian economics? What's the difference? Well, it's kind of a complicated question because it, it deals on a methodological level, a method level, and then a practical level, okay? So in, 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 in the face of it, both Austrian economics and mainstream economics start with a focus on the individual as a unit of analysis. Uh, Keynesian economics deviates from that and focuses on the macroeconomy as a whole. But you, you, re, you pick up a standard economics textbook and it's gonna talk about individuals and their decisions. But the way they choose to do that is they try to mathematize it. And so they treat it as a constrained optimization problem and in order to do constrained optimization problems, they try to reduce the world to smooth and continuous and twice differentiable functions so that they can do calculus on them. And then they get optimality results. And that's kind of the way economics progresses. Um, economics from Adam Smith all the way up to Hayek um, has two primordial facts about it. One of them is, is that individuals pursue their own self-interest, or as Mises puts it, they pursue their own purposes, right? And then also Paris gets fed, the great Bastiat idea, right? So look out the window, Paris is getting fed, and the question is, how is it that possible? And so the real question is, how do you derive this invisible hand theorem, Paris gets fed, from the rational choice postulate? And if you think in terms of modeling and measuring, what you do is you collapse the one to the other through heroic assumptions, right? So perfect knowledge assumptions, uh, you know, frictionless environments and whatnot. To the Austrian economist, it's the exact opposite. You derive the invisible hand theorem from the rational choice postulate via institutional analysis of the role of private property, the role of prices, the role of profit and loss. And so property provides us with high powered incentives, Prices provide us with the information that's necessary for our decisions, and profit and loss accounting provides us with the discipline of losses and the lure of pure profits to give us innovation in the economy. And so what you get is the three Ps, property prices and profit loss. You get the three I's of incentives, information, and innovation. The reason why some countries are rich is because they have high-powered incentives, accurate flows of information, and they have innovation. The reason why some countries are poor is because they lack the incentives, they have poor quality information, and they lack innovation. And that's the reason why, and that's a function of the institutions of property prices and profit and loss. So now think about all the things that are involved in having secure and enforceable property rights, of accurate price system, of accurate profit and loss accounting. And then you'll see all the policy implications, right? You need to have freedom of trade. 
right? You need to have contract law. Now, that doesn't mean you need to have the state be the provider of those things, right? But what you need to do is you need to have, you know, these institutions in place. And the Austrian school and classical liberal economists in general tend to focus on those things. And so that's the real distinguishing characteristic is rather than focusing on the behavioral characteristics and the modeling exercise, the Austrians tend to focus on the institutional environment within which exchange behavior takes place. And so that means that we're going to focus on the framework. And that's why you're uncompromising about the framework, because if you don't have, you know, private property and the rule of law, what's going to happen to your ability to engage in exchange relations, right? And so private property is the key issue. And you can't, private property is not like being somewhat pregnant, right? <laughs> you know, you either have it or it's attenuated. And so think about all the things that we live in in the world that we live in, which are attenuated property rights. This goes to like in your background, legal field, like the takings clause in the United States. You know, the reason why Epstein's book on takings was so important was because it showed that so many regulations that we adopted are actually, when you peel away the, the stuff, they're really takings, right? They're, they're not compensated takings to a businessman. Because I've, what I've done is I've actually taken their property without just compensation. So that, that law, that regulation never should have got passed. So you think about Epstein's book, what he does is he winnows out so many regulations that, we, that we've adopted since the progressive era in the United States. But Mises was saying the same thing, you know, 40 years ago, which is private property is the, is the foundation of economic calculation, which is the foundation of economic ad advancement. And when you violate private property rights, you're going to screw up the economic system. So I, I agree with you about Mises, his book, Liberalism, and human action are fantastic uh, presentations of the of, of the consistent and persistent private property position. And I should add Murray yeah. Rothbard in here as well. Yeah, the, because yeah, Murray Rothbard's an important figure. Yeah, what? because Roth, Rothbard and Man, Economy, and State, and Mises and Human Action, and other books they talk about real human beings that are interacting, and right. so. It, it's easier to understand how prices come into existence as compared to anything I remember from my economics classes was just charts yeah. and supply and demand curves, yeah. which, uh, but By let way, me, bumper, we're about out of time. Back, yeah. I was just going to say, if you go back in time, you'll see this ability to communicate the role of the price system is in Bombavrik, who was Mises' teacher. So Bombavrik has this fantastic, you know, section and value in, in, the, in this capital and interest book. Uh, which you can get a smaller version of called value and price, which is about the horse market and the way in which prices for the horses emerge in the market. And it's a fantastic discussion about exchange relations. So the ability of the Austrians to explain real price formation as opposed to developing a model of a model price is totally different, and it's vi very vitally important. Yeah, it makes, it makes economics exciting. We're, we're about out of time, but can you just give us a little synopsis of the growing popularity of Austrian economics? I know you alluded to this at the beginning of the show, but tell us a little bit about how it's grown from that little obscure seminar at NYU University that yeah. ACES was doing all the way up to what's happening today. Well, I, I think you can, you got to divide it into two groups. The first group is the academic step, which I talked about, which is the important role that the Institute for Humane Studies, Foundation for Economic Education, and in conjunction with the hard work of Israel Kirzner and Murray Rothbart to generate a whole new generation of economic scientists and economic teachers. And we've had this growing influence. I mean, just last year, we placed five students in university positions, and that's happening year after year after year. And our goal is to have an Austrian economist in every university in the United States and North America and Europe within the next 25 years. And, and we're really working hard to do that. But there's also been a tremendous growth of explosion in the popular culture. And I think, you know, that's a function of frustration with the existing status quo um, and the slagging economy. 
but also because of the role you can't underestimate it that Ron Paul played in getting people to pay attention to, you know, someone like Ludwig von Mises, who Ron Paul, you know, read a lot of and thought a lot about. I mean, Ron Paul was around when I was a kid. He just didn't have the platform, <laughs> right? So, you know, Ron Paul faced the, you know, he talked and there would be 20 people there. Then, you know, by the end, a few years ago, he was talking and soccer stadiums would be filled up, right? So, I mean, um, and and uh, so I think that that brought a whole new generation to care about these ideas. And then the Internet. So three things. The Internet made this information available for anyone who was curious enough to find it. You know, when I was starting these things, I had to go to old bookstores to get the old books, right? I had to go to Strand Bookstore in New York City to try to find, like, some of these books because they weren't in libraries and they weren't around at any bookstores. And, uh, and so, you know, Ron Paul, the Internet, and then the hard work that was done by Foundation for Economic Education, and then the Institute for Humane Studies in conjunction with Murray Rothbard, uh, you know, Israel Kirzner, and then their prodigy that came out of that. And so if I was talking to investors, I'd say Austrian economics is a growth industry, and you should buy buy now <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and go long. Go long, don't sell short. You know, uh, the world is moving in our direction, and, uh, you know, we've become better communicators. I mean, all the issues is, is falling on us. We have to think clear, write clear, and be more entrepreneurial in the way we communicate our message. Well, there's few people that do it better than you, and it's an exciting movement. I mean, to see libertarianism grow in popularity and at the same time to see Austrian economics, despite all the bad stuff that's coming out of Washington. It's very, very exciting. Yeah. and. Uh, it's exciting to be part of it with you, Pete, and thanks for taking the time yeah. to be on the show. And that's Pete Betke, and this is the Libertarian Angle, and uh, we'll see you next week.